Good evening, and thank you all for coming to this presentation this evening on a new master's degree that Georgetown University is offering in the Gulf region. My name is Daniel Stoll. I'm Senior Associate Dean for the School of Continuing Studies at Georgetown University's campus in Washington, DC, although I had been working at the Georgetown campus here in Doha for the last seven or eight years. And I'm joined by a colleague from Washington, Dr. Tim Frazier. He is the faculty director of the Emergency and Disaster Management Program. And at the end of the table, we have another colleague from the Doha campus here, Tariq Shakawi. And Tariq is available for translation. If we need that, we'll proceed in, in English. But if there's a need for translation, please raise hand and, and we'll continue on. What we'd like to do is um, elaborate a bit on the brochures you, you have picked up at registration, and then spend most of the time, though, answering any questions that, that might come about. Um, by way of background, I will say that the idea for this program was generated almost two years ago in conversations that Georgetown had with uh, Dr. Adnan El-Tamimi, uh, with the GCC's Emergency Management uh, Committee. And um, in the course of those conversations, it became clear that there seemed to be a need for, or there, there could be an opportunity to offer a degree of this kind. And so over the past several months, we've been working very closely with uh, Dr. El-Tamimi to come uh, bring together this particular program, which is modeled very closely on the degree that Georgetown already offers in the United States but we are delivering it with a context for the Gulf Cooperation Council in the Gulf region. So that by way of context, I'm gonna have my colleague, Dr. Fraser, do much of the talking. Again, translation available if you need it. And then at the end, we can uh, answer any questions that you might have. Thank you. Thank you, Dan. So uh, just first, let me say thank you for, for all your interest and for coming. I uh, appreciate the opportunity to speak to you tonight. Uh, and happy to take questions at the end. Uh, and if there's something that you just have to know along the way, you can stop me, that doesn't, that doesn't disturb me. So uh, we are uh, Georgetown, and as Dan said, uh, I am uh, the program director for the Emergency Disaster Management Program at Georgetown University. So uh, we, have, we had one program when I started in June, and we have four now. Uh, and there's a very, a very good reason for each one of the programs. And as Dan said, the GCC program here uh, has a very specific uh, focus on the region. And so we think that's a critically important that we focus on the region and provide expertise with, on the region. So uh, the program that we deliver in the U.S. is very U.S.-centric, which wouldn't really be appropriate for emergency disaster management here. So why Georgetown, right? Uh, you know, some of the, the things that we see in emergency and disaster management, we see lots of different places that have uh, programs that they try to deliver. Uh, several universities in the U.S. have uh, programs in emergency and disaster management. Uh, but we think our program is a little different. Uh, uh, we think there's things that set us apart that's critically important if you're thinking about emergency disaster management from a more uh, holistic perspective. So when we talk about emergency disaster management at Georgetown, we're not just talking about response. Uh, we're talking about sort of a more holistic, broad perspective from that, and uh, also a much more sophisticated perspective. So along those, li along those lines, it's critical to, um, uh, to form critical thinking skills uh, that, that go with emergency disaster management and decision making. Uh, we hope that we're providing strategic leadership skills, well, we know we are. And so graduates from our program would have sort of the critical thinking skills needed to be in higher level uh, government or, or private uh, company to make those decisions that are necessary there in these complex, complicated uh, disaster management routines. 
Uh, we offer a very dynamic classroom uh, experience with projects. And as you'll see in a few slides, the model that we have in place uh, really takes advantage of a cohort learning strategy and a cohort learning style. And I'll explain that in much more detail in a few minutes. Uh, lots of group work, uh, brainstorming and discussions. Uh, we think it's important that you learn from the faculty that run the program, but also we think it's critically important that you learn from each other as well. So along that line, I want to say early on uh, that the program uh, is an executive program. I'll explain that in more detail uh, throughout the presentation. But one thing that I want you to understand early is that we understand uh, that most people that participate in the executive program have a full-time job. And we understand that you have obligations throughout the week. Uh, and as such, we've catered our program uh, to allow you to, to work full-time and still participate fully in the program. Um, so we do understand uh, that, that sort of criteria. So we, we, we really strive to bring in current and emerging real world, world threats. We provide a lot of case studies of, of local and regional places where those current and emerging threats come out. Uh, we, we teach to those threats. But again, highly qualified and experienced faculty. Uh, one of the opportunities that we have at Georgetown that's absent at other universities is that uh, we have a, rep a strong reputation, a strong academic reputation that's been fostered over 200 years. And so when we, and we have this sort of opportunity being in Washington, D.C. to engage in a lot of the federal agencies in the U.S. that, that uh, participate in emergency disaster management, Red Cross, humanitarian relief, humanitarian aid. And so by the fact that we have a high uh, quality reputation and a high status in the community, it's, it's quite easy for us to approach uh, high-level individuals and have them participate in our program. So we've been very successful at that. Uh, so there is a high qualified, experienced faculty. Uh, ethics and leadership is also important for Georgetown. It's part of Georgetown's mission. And we always have an emphasis on participation in our program. So there's lots of things that, that separate us from a traditional, uh, even master's program in emergency and disaster management. So how we learn. Um, uh, the model that we've uh, put together for our executive master's program in the U.S. and the executive master's program in the GCC is an intensive 15-month program. There's some subtle differences uh, in terms of the timing and delivery of the program, which has to do with uh, cultural uh, events that occur in the Middle East that, that don't occur in the U.S., so there's a little bit of difference there. Uh, but it's an intensive 15-month program. Uh, it's a cohort model, and so when I, when I talk about a cohort model, what I'm really talking about is that uh, the incoming class is a cohort, and we have them go through the first class together, the second class together, the third, the fourth, and then the fifth. And the reason that we do it that way is that we want, the, again, the class to learn from each other, uh, and as well as uh, from the faculty uh, that are teaching in the program. So let me give you an example of that. And so. We have someone in the audience that, that is uh, from Georgetown uh, here at Doha that, that uh, was going to give a few, it's going to say a few words at the end, but I'm going to uh, give you an example of, of what I mean by the cohort model for this person. This, this person is, is currently taking the executive program in the U.S. It starts next week. And so they bring the experience of their, one of their duties in their current job is they are the emergency manager, if you will, so to speak for Georgetown and Doha, and they have to plan for evacuation of students, they have to plan for evacuation of faculty and staff, uh, among other things. And they've also, have, in the past, have, have brought, brought students from Egypt when there were some, some challenges and issue, issues in Egypt uh, to Doha and took care of the students, evacuated the students here. So that's an experience that they have in the workforce that could be invaluable for a, a classroom experience for, for students that haven't had that opportunity or haven't had those experiences. So that's just a quick example of that. Uh, so we have four eight week, eight week, eight week, I'm sorry, hybrid courses, uh, six credits each, uh, and a capstone course at the end that's 18 weeks. And we split that capstone course into two different time periods, as you'll see. And, and the predominant reason for that was we wanted to be sure to we give our students the time they need to produce a quality capstone project. And I'll discuss what a quality capstone project is a few slides later. So one thing I want to point out that's really important is that the first seven weeks of the eight-week course is online. So we, the expectation is three hours a week. So again, plenty of opportunity for you to do your, 
day job, if you will, and still be able to participate in that pro in the program. Uh, and then we do on-site intensives or on-site residencies. Uh, that's six days per course, uh, nine hours a day. Uh, those are long days, really intense days. That makes up 72% of our contact hours. So even though the program has a, a big online component to it, seven weeks of online learning, the majority of the contact hours are face-to-face. -face. So it's not really an online program, uh, given that the contact hours are face-to-face, -face and very traditional in terms of how that's delivered. So let me give you an example of what we're planning for. That's a beautiful song. Uh, let me give you an example of what we're planning for for our executive uh, GCC program in terms of an on-site residence. So, so we know uh, in this region that uh, uh, Oman has faced uh, natural hazards, natural, nat natural disasters in the past, specifically the, the typhoon that hit in 2007. So really a disastrous uh, typhoon with uh, billions of dollars worth of damage, uh, loss of life, a, a huge societal impact uh, that occurred there. So the natural hazards and disasters course uh, that's, in our, uh, that's in our program the residency for that uh, this year, this first year of the program will be in uh, Oman. And so they'll naturally have a bit of a focus on the typhoon. And so we want to look for things like uh, the geophysical event itself. We want to talk about the level of preparedness before the event. How was response conducted during the event? How did they do? Did they do a good job? You know, where were areas where they were, were they deficient? And what have they learned from that sort of event and that sort of experience? And how would, they, how would they fare if they had another typhoon hit uh, this year, next year, the year after next? Have they learned from the process? It allows us, it gives us the opportunity to take a real case study, real world case study example and teach our students throughout that process. Because there may be students that come from public health uh, into our program that are predominantly interested in the public health component. And there's an opportunity looking at a disaster from a case study perspective like that for, for there to be a huge public health focus at one side of that. So uh, that's just an example of, of uh, a on-site residency event. Uh, and obviously, uh, we would get speakers. Uh, the general that was in charge uh, of the response for the event, uh, we had plans to line him up as a speaker and other individuals. And it's not just this one focus, uh, but obviously, we want to take advantage of the local expertise wherever we can. So the courses for the, uh, and the academic calendar for the coming year, uh, there's five courses uh, in the program. Uh, Theory and Regional Collaboration Framework is the first course. And that course, uh, will, of course, dates are January 11th through March 5th, with the residency dates here in Doha on January 21st and to uh, January 26th. So again, six days, nine hours a day, lots of stuff, 72% of the contact hours, again, coming with that. A uh, natural technological hazards and disasters course uh, that will start on March 15th and run through May 8th. Uh, the residency dates of that are March 18th through the 23rd again in Oman. Uh, terrorism and man-made disasters, a little bit different, uh, focused in the natural and technological hazards class. Uh, June 28th through August 19th, uh, residency dates 15th through the 20th of July, and that'll be in Washington, D.C. So you have the opportunity to come see us should you want to participate in the program. We'd be happy to have you. Uh, the next class is public health and humanitarian crisis. We all know that every natural hazard and, and uh, every disaster has the potential to be a public health and humanitarian crisis, uh, even if it's not realized. And let me give you an example of that. And so the, the earthquake uh, in, off the coast of Japan that generated the tsunami uh, that hit Fukushima and so we saw a lot of societal damage from the tsunami. We all saw probably video of that, and we saw the amazing impact of the tsunami and the devastation that that caused. Uh, and then it damaged the nuclear reactor. And so because it damaged the nuclear reactor, now we have radiation and leaks and radiation spills and contamination. So it, uh, it's also in a region around in, the, uh, in Japan where they tend to have lots of gardens and grow a lot of food, and now it becomes a public health crisis because of the, the release of the radiation and also with the contamination of the ground and, and the uh, recommendation to not consume food that you grow for a number of years. So that had a devastating impact on the community as well. 
and then it goes beyond the region in that we see uh, the contamination uh, drifting ashore in different places around the world where, where, the, where we have a beach and the wave gets to. So that's a really nice example of a complete sort of holistic emergency disaster management event that starts with the geophysical hazard of the earthquake that generated the tsunami all the way through to uh, the, the sort of crisis when it comes to food all the way through public health emergency. So, so public health is critically important and then, uh, another strong component of the public health course is the, the fact that we have a lot of media response with public health. Public health tends to be something where uh, the media can, can make a statement and the public can react uh, you know, in an extreme way because of the fear that is generally there and the perception of risk that the public has for uh, public health humanitarian crisis. And then we have a capstone course that runs October 26th to December 19th, and then we split that, uh, and, and it runs again January 10th through March 6th, uh, and the capstone residency February 24th through March 1st, which will be here in Doha as well. So it's the academic calendar. That's the way we've put it together. And so I've, I've, uh, we'll go through each one of the classes and give you a little more information about the course itself. But obviously, each class gets one slide, and I don't, and I, uh, don't have the opportunity to tell you everything that's in the course. So we'd be happy to uh, get some questions on these as well. So when we talk about strategic, operational, and legal frameworks of a regionally based emergency management program, we want to sort of emphasize the fact that there's things that you can do from a legal perspective, things you can't do. There's restraints and there's, you know, opportunities to succeed and there's also constraints associated with that as well. And so we want to talk through those legal constraints and those legal opportunities when we put together this course and deliver this class. So also we understand that uh, the natural hazard or the disaster doesn't recognize uh, the national border or boundary. And so it's really critically important if you have a toxic spill or if you have a typhoon or a tsunami or a flood event or a fire event, it doesn't stop at the border just because that's where the government stops. And so it's really critically important for disaster management uh, to have collaboration across the region. So this is something that we'll uh, give particular emphasis to uh, given the, the, uh, the regional focus of the program. So we analyze processes and relationships for cooperation and opportunities for cooperation. And also, we'll talk about some of the limitations for cooperation and some of the challenges for cooperation, uh, and frustrations that might arise uh, given the, the political nature of, of uh, nationalities. So also included in the course is risk assessment. How do you do a risk, ass risk assessment? What's a quality risk assessment? Uh, what does that mean? And, uh, we'll talk about national and international logistics as, as it relates to emergency disaster response. Memorandums of understanding or cooperation among different agencies, among different uh, countries, and how those seem, sound good on paper, but sometimes those fall apart uh, when it comes time to respond. And sometimes people are heroic and step up where they don't have agreements. So the natural, natural and technological hazards and disasters class it's, it's as the title suggests, we'll focus on natural hazards. There'll be an array of natural hazards that we cover, but there will be uh, predominantly natural hazards that are specific to the region. Uh, we got a, a list that was recommended to us by the GC, uh, and we're, we'll, we'll teach to that list, but we'll also get the opportunity to discuss more uh, than, than what's just on that list. And we want to sort of explore all the issues around uh, emergency management and disaster response, not just a discussion of the natural hazard event itself. And, and a good example, as we've already discussed, is uh, the typhoon that hit Oman. So definitely natural hazards and then definitely technological hazards. Uh, what we've seen in our, in our brief time here this past week uh, are in, in engaging the, the stakeholders that are participants of the potential participants of the program is there's a real concern for technological hazards as well. We talk about something like industrial uh, chemical release, accidental industrial chemical release, or perhaps industrial chemical release uh, related to terrorism and terrorist events. So uh, those components are covered in that class. And then we also have a class that's very specific to terrorism and man-made disasters. So we want to talk about challenges associated with managing chemical, biological, radiological, nuclear, explosive, cyber attacks, uh, et cetera. There's more than we have just in our list there. 
Uh, we want to really examine and understand the possibilities and limits for, uh, for managing these events and some of the current and emerging technologies that can assist in managing those events and responding to those events as well. Take advantage of that with, the, with that course. We already talked uh, a bit about public health and humanitarian crisis, but we think that's an important part of the emergency management and disaster response uh, cycle, if you will. Many times, uh, public health and humanitarian is separated from emergency management. Often, it's sort of seen as its own sort of thing. And we think that if you put together a holistic emergency management program, and if you don't include public health, then it's not a holistic emergency management program. And again, if you think about the Fukushima example that we just gave, public health is critically important to response recovery, uh, both short and long term. So we think it's vital and, and we want a separate course just for public health. We think it's that important. Uh, things that we'll cover in that class can include the complexities of public health and humanitarian crisis, uh, emerging health security threats to GCC member countries, as well as we want to explore management strategies for public health, emergencies, disaster response. You know, I'll give you an example of, 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 of a situation. It may not be uh, easily understood, but it's a very simple situation. We were, or we were asked, or I was asking a specific piece of research to look at uh, different types of, of flus, including avian flu and those sorts of strains, and the, and the problems that those cause from an emergency management perspective. And so we evaluated uh, all sorts of components of uh, the healthcare system and its ability to deliver a response. And one of the things that we noticed was they were basing their capability to respond on the number of beds that they had at the hospital facility. And so if you had 200 beds at the hospital facility, they were assuming that they could handle 200 patients uh, with, with, that, was, that was suffering from some type of flu virus. And what we pointed out to them was, yeah, you have 200 beds, but you only have five ventilators. And so typically what, what is the limiting factor in being able to respond to some type of respiratory problem like the flu is do you have ventilators? And if you don't have enough ventilators, then that's it. It didn't matter that they had 200 beds, they weren't gonna be able to use 195 of them. And so, so really looking at things from a very, it's very complex, very challenging to piece all that together into a holistic program, but, but that's what we're gonna do at Georgetown. And so the capstone, capstone course, uh, we want to be able to integrate sort of the knowledge uh, that was developed throughout the program and all the, all the different courses into sort of a challenging capstone experience uh, that also demonstrates the mastery of the material and, and of the subject. So I'll explain a little bit about what we mean when we talk about a capstone experience and what, what, what the sort of end product will look like for our students who come to the, our, our, our program. So there'll, there'll be two different sort of versions of a capstone project. One that would be more like a technical report. Maybe it's a, it's a capstone project that looks at an evacuation plan and sort of evaluates whether or not that evacuation plan is a good plan. It looks for holes in the plan and it provides suggestions and opportunities for enhancement of that evacuation plan. The student then writes a technical report uh, related to that and can share that technical report back to the community back to the agency, perhaps where they're working or who are, who are sponsoring them, or share it with, uh, with the GCC at large. And so that's a really nice example of a capstone project from that perspective. Uh, and so the other sort of option that students can choose from will be a capstone project that, that has the, the possibility for publication. And we talk about publication in a, in a peer-reviewed journal or publication in some other uh, technical report published in, in certain instances. When we talk about a, that sort of level of engagement, we're talking about a sort of more, more sophisticated, more advanced, more research heavy. So there won't be a requirement for you to do that, but there will certainly be the opportunity if student, choose to, if student chooses to pursue that. So you can see the range that we built into the capstone. Um, and, and we think that that will be an excellent opportunity for students to do something that we refer to as service-based learning, where there's an opportunity to work for an agency or with an agency and produce a project or produce a piece of work that can directly go back and benefit that agency. So we're very strong, uh, given our, our, the Jesuit miss, mission of our university, we're very strong on uh, giving back to the community. And so we want to have a capstone project that allows us to do that. So I, I, always, I, I sort of laugh when I see this slide every time we give the presentation, why emergency and disaster management? Well, 
if you have to ask that question, you're probably not in the room already because you know it's important and you know it's critical um, for, for moving forward with society. So, but uh, but I, I think from a more sophisticated perspective, we can talk about the evolving threats and hazards. So we're living in a different world than we lived in even 30, 40, 50 years ago where there's more sophistication uh, that's needed to handle the emerging threats and hazards that we have because the response that we need is increasingly more complex. So it's not a simple problem with a simple solution. It's a complex problem that requires a complex solution. And so we hope to be graduating uh, our students that are into leadership positions that are capable of making those really complex, difficult decisions uh, in emergency disaster management, particularly from a leadership position. And so we know that there's always opportunity for people to work along the way and, and whatever level they want to work in, but uh, we think our students will have the, the capability and the opportunity to work in high-level positions in whatever, in whatever area of emergency disaster management that they choose. So I'll talk a little bit about this, uh, something that we call the disaster recovery timeline. Uh, it's a piece of work that I personally have done where, where I think it gives a really good holistic overall explanation of our program. Uh, it's work that I did in Florida looking at sort of uh, disaster recovery uh, in a hurricane event or a hurricane environment. And so traditionally there's emergency, there's the emergency phase where that's where you go out and get water to everyone and make sure everyone from a medical perspective is being taken care of. And there's the restoration phase where you start to start, start to rebuild and recover and you assess the infrastructure damage, the building damage and those sorts of issues and challenges. There's the uh, reconstruction one phase where you begin to rebuild after the disaster, the reconstruction two phase where you finish the rebuilding and you hope that during this part of the disaster phase you've, you've recovered. And so I took this work and I presented it to a group of stakeholders, a group of people in the field, and they asked me, can we add another phase to this? I said, absolutely, you're the stakeholder. You can do whatever you want. It's for you and you can do whatever you want with it. And what they decided to do was add a pre-disaster phase. And what they meant by the pre-disaster phase, they wanted to do things pre-disaster that would help them move through the disaster recovery timeline in a more efficient, faster way. So I think this encompasses our program because we're not just talking about emergency disaster response or emergency disaster recovery. We're talking about emergency disaster preparedness and planning as well. And so another example might be, uh, you know, we might have localized flooding because we get a lot of runoff already. And so we're building a new road. I know you guys have a lot of building going on around here. I've seen it personally. And so there may take the opportunity when you're building a new road or you're, fi or you're repairing a road that's, that's already damaged to put a big culvert in so that it can hold more water. And you might do that because you know that there's more development coming upstream and with more development, you'll get more runoff and you'll get more localized flooding. And this is particularly important uh, in a place like Oman where they get a lot of flooding, a lot of flash flooding. And so you, 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 you widen that culvert and you make that culvert bigger and that's a sort of a planning decision that has the impact of enhancing resilience and reducing vulnerability and reducing the likelihood that you might get flooding in the future. So we're talking about pre-disaster planning from that perspective as well. So important uh, and, and very, very much uh, a more holistic way to look at emergency disaster management. So along that line, if we're thinking about it from a very holistic perspective, and I just gave you the example of a planner a traditional typical planner and the role that a planner might have in hazard mitigation or resilience enhancement, uh, there's, there's a great number of uh, career industries and opportunities for our graduates. Uh, that could be uh, human services, military first response, sort of the things that you might see uh, traditional with that, meteorology, so predictive nature of that. And, and we spoke at the Meteorology Center in Oman this week, and they're doing great work in, in terms of trying to help predict where flooding will occur and issue warnings. And so there's that, there's humanitarian, traditional emergency management, uh, foreign affairs, public policy, uh, urban and regional planning, energy sources, uh, a great number of opportunities associated with our degree. It's not just constrained to emergency management. So who should apply? Well, everyone in the room should apply. That's easy, uh, time to move on, right? Uh, well, our ideal candidate has six plus years of experience and leadership in emergency management or a closely related field. 
And I think you'll see that I bolded a uh, closely related field. It's bolded better on my screen, but it still looks bolded. And so we really want to emphasize the fact that we're not just looking for people that already do emergency management. Uh, again, a planner, someone that is a business uh, continuity expert that's concerned about a uh, business being able to continue and the impact of a natural hazard or an event on a business. Uh, we, would, we would welcome that, that individual as well. So closely related fields, uh, including people that work in public health. We had several people already approach us uh, that work with Doctors Without Borders that were really interested in our program. Inter international humanitarian assistance, well, that should be pretty obvious. It's important we have uh, individuals from Red Cross teaching our program in, in, uh, in Washington, D.C. Again, first response, community service, law enforcement, uh, defense, et cetera. So lots of opportunity from different backgrounds. One thing that is important to us is that the people that apply have a clear vision for how the program fits in their specific plans and what their uh, uh, for career development and what their goals are for the future. Uh, the application requirements, uh, all in the brochure in front of you, but I'll go through these really quickly. So it's an online application, uh, no need to fly to DC to apply. Uh, a, a relatively reasonable $50 U.S. application fee. Uh, we require a personal statement, uh, resume or CV, two letters of recommendation, official transcripts from all previously attended institutions and proof of English uh, uh, proficiency. So uh, nothing out of the ordinary. This is really standard uh, mission, mission requirements for any university, any reputable university anyway. Uh, the thing that I want to uh, draw your attention to that's also bolded it's a statement across the bottom and that for this particular program, this cohort that's coming up uh, that launches in January, the application deadline is December 1st. So be sure to get your application in before December 1st as I'm sure all of you will apply. Uh, the other thing that I want to specifically talk about is a personal statement. I want to give a little bit of context there. Uh, it's important that we uh, have a personal statement. It's part of the admission requirement at Georgetown, so we're not um, changing that requirement or enhancing that requirement. Uh, the requirement is three to five page essay uh, for admission. Uh, we want you to explain why you want to pursue the master's degree. Uh, it should be typed, double spaced, and it should answer the following questions. What are the specific academic and professional qualities you possess that could help you excel within the program? We want to know that. We want to know what your goals are. Uh, what goals do you hope to achieve if you're accepted into this program? Uh, also want to know how ethics factor into your everyday life, both personally and professionally. You know, describe a situation where that you uh, had to engage your personal ethics to make a very difficult or tough decision to overcome a challenge. And what did you learn from that experience? So we want to know that information because we want you to be successful in our program. And one of the ways for you to be successful is if we admit the type of uh, quality, the type of student that has those sorts of goals in mind and is driven and, and then it can help ensure success. And the other thing about it is that we, we use that three to five page essay uh, to, to understand writing composition ability and English proficiency. And it, it doesn't just apply to international students. We, we, we have a three to five page essay requirement for domestic students as well because we really do, uh, there's a lot of writing that goes on in this master's level course. It is a master's degree from Georgetown University, and we have a high expectation uh, that we place upon our students. Contact information, uh, no need to scurry and write it all down. Uh, we do have that in the brochure in front of you. I just want to present it here as well. And so I think at this time, we're happy to take uh, questions. Yes, ma'am. Is, is it like a specific number or? Well, anything less than two million. No, uh, <laughs> I'm sorry, joking. Uh, yeah, we, we typically try to cap the program at a certain number because it is a cohort experience, and there's, it's a more quality experience if you if you have a cap on the program if you limit it because it's very difficult, as you know, to have a class that has a heavy discussion component if you have a hundred people in the class. So we're limiting that to 30 to 40 the first year. We're going to see how it goes from there. Traditionally, in the past, what has been the admission rate? Do you, you know? Well, the, the story here is longer than it should be, but I'll tell you, tell you it anyway. And the story is that uh, the, this is the first year that we've actually separated our program. We had an executive program at, 
at Georgetown where uh, we had up to 50 or 60 students at a time in that program. And what we've learned from that is that that's really not uh, as good an experience as we'd like to have for our students. And so the result for that, how we adjusted that was we put into place, we, we kept our executive uh, master's program that requires six years experience for that now, and we've developed a master's program that's online and a master's program where students have the opportunity to take courses in residence. And so we've capped that at about 25 in the U.S. Uh, and we're testing that out as well. As you, you, a, good, a good program will always make adjustments along the way, particularly for quality experience for the student. And so we're serious about delivering that quality experience. And so it's not about how many dollars we can make. It's capped at a certain point so that we know that we get a really quality cohort experience for our students. Just one more question, if I may. I'm sorry. I was just uh, so the admission deadline is by December first, yes, and then the course starts in January. So within how much time are we expected to get a response, feedback, whether we're admitted or not? Yeah, we're really quick, and so uh, yeah, I, I, that's a really good question. I don't I don't know that anyone's brought that up, but and I don't know the specific answer in terms of 24 hours. You'll know. I know that we review. We have a, a, a really great admission staff in our college and we review applications continuously. So I think it would be a reasonable announcement and I, I hate to promise anything, but trust me, we'll, ad we'll address the issue and the challenge and, and you'll know uh, in adequate time to prepare for the course. Thank you. Yeah, <laughs> if you wait to December 1st, you might, you know, it might be a good Christmas present for you or maybe something that comes later for you, but uh, yeah, the earlier you apply, because we do rolling admissions. I believe, is there a question? Plus, you want to be one of the 30, right? Yeah. I have uh, two questions. Uh, the brochure sh says that uh, each course is five days, right? Six. Six days. Residency. The residency. The course. The f I'm talking about the five courses. The the on-site residency. Yes, six days. Yes, sir. Six days. Okay, in case, I mean, I believe maybe all of us are working. In case uh, I can't attend one of those courses in Washington due to uh, project running or, or some family issues, can I, is there any recovery plan? Uh, yeah, that's a question that's come up a couple of times and, and currently no, uh, it, because it's a cohort model, it would be really difficult or challenging for us to, to sort of push that to another time. So unfortunately, the way the, court, the program is designed now, that's, that's really not much, much of an option. Uh, although there, there are maybe some individual case-by-case -case bases if someone is incredibly ill or something like that, uh, but, but it would be an extreme anomaly uh, to have, not have that, uh, be able to have that capstone experience and move to the program. Can, can you elaborate a little bit on the, uh, I think there is a research that we need to do in order to graduate or something? Capstone. Capstone. Uh, elaborate. Elaborate on the capstone. Okay. There is a project we need to do at the end of the course, right? Can you elaborate what kind of project? Yeah, I, I can a bit, sure. So. So the project that you might do for the capstone would be in consultation with your academic advisor uh, that you would have with the program. And so you would work together with your academic advisor to come up with a project that was seen as uh, significant enough to qualify you for uh, credit for the project and, and for the degree. It's hard for me to sort of say specifically what that might be, but I, and I gave examples where or if you came and, and, and you had a project, where, where do you work? Do you, do you mind? What type of work do you do? Oil and gas operation. Oil and okay. gas operation. Okay. So, so you might have a project that talks about a response to uh, a petroleum spill, a gas, a gas leak, a wildfire, or I'm sorry, a fire, uh, some other aspect of your company or the, the place where you work or that, that may or, or may not benefit them. And so I'm, I'm sure that we, with, with consultation with your academic advisor, you could come up with a project that was significant enough that would qualify you for credit for the course. And so what we, what we would try to be, you know, give the opportunity for you to be efficient 
and especially since you know you want to, you may be there participating in our program as a result of the the industry or the company or the agency that you work for pay for you to be there so so creating a project that, that provides an opportunity for you to give something back to the agency would be absolutely fantastic for us so it's hard for me to say exactly what it would be um, but but again the determination would be a sufficient technical report that would provide insights or recommendations would be a summary of the research that you've done uh, that could be something that you would give back to your agency would be a qualification for the capstone course um, thank you so much for the presentation my name is uh, Hamed Ibrahim I work in the Department of Radiation Protection and Chemical Hazard I have um, a nuclear engineering and a bachelor degree in nuclear engineering um, I was actually thinking about this program and I wanted to apply in Texas University and it somehow it happened and it came here to Doha, so I'm, I'm really glad. Uh, there's one thing, like um, studying nuclear engineering physics and I was thinking to relate this emergency management would be really good personally for me. So considering all these uh, neighbor countries trying or they're building already nuclear power plants. And uh, as far as you know, the GCC counselor, the uh, they approved the regional emergency nuclear and radiological plan last year, I think. Um, can you just uh, explain more like um, the nuclear and radiological events, how this program will help me in, manage in management? And I know the emergency is not, I work in risk assessment, so I know the emergency preparedness and planning, like three stages and all that. But can you explain more to me how this program will really help me in, in applying the emergency plans uh, in the regional events. I'll do my best. I'll have to confess to you that I started my undergraduate degree in nuclear engineering, and obviously I don't have a degree in nuclear engineering, so uh, <laughs> congratulations to you uh, on that. And so, so obviously you would bring a specific expertise to the program uh, that, that would be at a higher level than maybe many of our faculty dealing with sort of the physics behind that, but at the same time, uh, <laughs> You know, managing the response doesn't necessarily have to do with the physics behind the nuclear uh, energy, right? So there's, as we talked about, there's a full suite of uh, collaboration opportunities. If you had an incident or an event, how do you get the word out? How do you deal with the public? You know, are there evacuations that need to occur? What's the sort of dispersion pattern of the, of the radiological material? Where is it dangerous and not dangerous? And so how do you deal with population for instance, that may be particularly exposed, if you have elderly or if you have a, a children or elderly that might have a propensity to be weaker and more susceptible to, uh, to that sort of risk and that sort of event. And then how do you coordinate the response? And when do you call for, when do you call for assistance from your, from your neighbors? And you may have a plan in place already that details all those steps. But what happens if uh, the event itself goes beyond the plan that you have in place? And then how do you know that the plan you have in place is an acceptable, capable uh, you know, plan that's going to help you deal with that sort of issue and challenge? And so we wouldn't be teaching you about nuclear engineering because you already know that, right? And that's not what our program is. We would try to teach you and help you understand you know, how to deal with the event itself from an emergency disaster management perspective. So do you really think this program is, will meet my needs, like nuclear engineering and emergency management? Yeah, I, I absolutely, absolutely, because again, it's what we see about it is one of the aspects of it that's critically important is sort of the understanding of risk assessment and conducting risk assessments, even if you've conducted those relative to other events, relative to uh, uh, applicable response, adequate applicable response, relative to aid, relative to sort of the population that may in fact be exposed to that event, you know, sort of a suite of issues or challenges. What is the public health? Uh, you know, what does public health have to do with your response? Uh, is public health going to be adequate? You know, do you need more of a public health response? You know, again, I gave you an example from the flu where we talked about they thought they had the situation covered because they had 200 hospital beds. And these are people that work in public health every day. And we noticed they were limited on their ventilators. So they couldn't really have the situation under control. So those are, we worked with the Center for Disease Control on that. And up and down the line, everyone thought the plan that they had in place was adequate, was going to sort of handle the situation, and they felt really confident. And they had a good plan. 
Um, but, you know, we've seen from previous natural hazards, previous technological disasters that sometimes even a good plan isn't sufficient. So absolutely, I think uh, our program could, could be a great benefit to you. All right, thank you so much. You're welcome. Uh, I have three questions. First one, uh, is this program uh, has been uh, like uh, approved or recognized by the Ministry, I mean, uh, Ministry of Education of Qatar or the Supreme Council of Education uh, as a, to be conducted with uh, like George University? Recognized, you mean? Mm -hmm. um, it's a Georgetown University degree. Georgetown's recognized and accredited by middle states in the United States. And just like our bachelors of foreign service here in, um, in, in Doha that we deliver at Education City is recognized, this degree would be as well. Okay, the second question regarding your uh, capstone, is it like it will be individual or it will be a group uh, project? The capstone? Yes. Um, well, Tim's pouring. It, um, generally, it's individual, but there is an opportunity for a number of students to work together. Obviously, if they're working together, that's going to be a, a broader, a bigger, more complex project. And you know, the end result must still be worthy of uh, graduate work. So you're putting in the same amount of effort. It might be in a slightly, it will be in a larger project, but it's, it's going to require that still, that degree of sustained effort. Yeah, so, so a good example, thanks Dan. I needed the water. Uh, so, so a risk assessment for maybe a local community of a relatively reasonable size or a small size versus a risk assessment for the entire country. And so if, if you had a, wanted to do a risk assessment for the entire country, then that would be an opportunity for students to work together on a project. And then maybe you're doing it and you're splitting the work with, you know, you got six students or eight students, and each one each student is taking uh, a region of the country and doing risk assessment for that and pulling together a final project. So, so, so we want to look for opportunities for our students to engage the community, engage the agencies they work with, and produce a product that's useful. And so we're, we're I'm in charge, for now anyway, until something happens. I'm in charge, and so I, we'll be really, really reasonable and do applied work that has a really nice service-based community learning, learning component to it. So as Dan so eloquently said, the size of the project, number of people you put on it brings up the size of the project. And so the, the, the Oman example that we gave where we've been asked by, uh, by, the, by them to do an assessment of their preparedness level and response to uh, the typhoon, and we've been asked to assess and not only the uh, response and their preparedness, but also how have they, what have they done since the typh typhoon that might make them more resilient in the future. And so that's a project that they've asked us to do for research, and we'll take that opportunity to have students that are interested work on that project along the way. Okay, thank you. The last question only about the classwork, or is it, will be an exams, or is it will be like an assignment? How it's like the, method of study? Uh, very, very, very few exams, if any. Of course, we, we don't micromanage our instructors to the point where I would go in and say, it's, you're not allowed to give an exam. But for it's graduate work, and graduate work tends to be more project-based, more, more writing intensive. And so it's our understanding that our instructors will follow the graduate model. So there'll be a lot of reading, uh, heavy in reading, uh, and, and writing. Uh, response to those readings, preparing sort of a project maybe we would, in, in one course we would ask you to do a risk assessment. We'll teach you how to do a risk assessment, ask you to do a risk assessment. There may be the opportunity in a class to put together a hazard uh, mitigation plan or an outline of a hazard mitigation plan. So that would be examples of projects in a course and then, then we would have you do uh, readings of, of material that was maybe perhaps difficult and provide a written response to that, a paper, a uh, short reaction note, uh, that type of that type of sort of assessment, uh, but but not very few, if any, uh, exams. Okay, thank you.
Uh, good evening, uh, Aaron McCord, critical care paramedic with uh, Hamid Ambulance Service. Um, my question was, is there a relative bachelor's degree that you're looking for with like relative coursework? I mean, is there a specific uh, bachelor's that you're looking for? Uh, no, we say closely related field and, and that gives us, it's not necessarily put into play to give us a lot of wiggle room, but there's an understanding that you could uh, specifically have a degree in business and management and then you would bring leadership skills to the cohort. Uh, you would bring your business skills and a big part of disaster recovery is economic. And so you could come in with a business background and it would be a totally acceptable background. So I don't think there's a, spe a specific degree we're looking for because you could sort of sit, sit there and tell me any degree that you could ever think of and I could, I could connect it back to emergency disaster management because the field is so broad. Yeah. Uh, just in terms of time commitment, so I'm able to understand that roughly, like, uh, so 54 hours per um, per week abroad plus seven weeks, so roughly like 75 hours plus the time required for assignments. So roughly, what 100 hours per course? Would that be a fair? I haven't done the math. I'm trusting your math ability. Because I'm uh, trying with this to yeah. understand in terms of capstone requirement, the time is going to be required. So it's spread on four to five months. So what yeah. is expected roughly? I mean, I think, I think the easy sort of math here is that the typical sort of statement that you make is for every three hours a week you spend in the classroom, you spend like nine hours a week outside the classroom. So you're talking for a graduate degree, 10 to 12 hours a week wouldn't be unreasonable to assume. And then the capstone is something that's put together over a period of time. And so we would help you along the way, come up with a project, an idea, and help you start to do the research through our library and through other resources that we have. So we would chip away at it. And, and uh, you know, I tell all my graduate students when they ask me how to do it, and the answer is simple. It's the same as eating an elephant, right? It's one bite at a time. And so we don't want to overwhelm you and push you into a corner and give you a huge piece of project or work to do in one week and not the other. There is a steady diet of work. If you stay on top of it, uh, it's reasonable to assume that you could spend 10 or so hours a week and be very successful with the program. And in terms of the capstone, is the deadline very set or there's always room for flexibility? I mean, you know, you're starting to make me nervous. <laughs> uh, but no, there, there, we, we want to have a set deadline, uh, but obviously there's things that happen. A case by case basis. And I'll give you an example. We have a student who's just finishing in our executive program in the U.S. He lives in Louisiana and he's an emergency responder. And Louisiana has been going through a massive flooding, a severe case of flooding. And so he made a special request to get an incomplete. And he's finishing his capstone project after the water recedes from his house. And so you know, we're, we're not tyrants. We understand. Uh, you know, bad things happen to good people, and I think, uh, you know, we're not going to go into it and I wouldn't say to you up front, yeah, the deadline is sort of just there, it's arbitrary. It is the deadline, and it takes a special circumstance to go beyond the deadline. However, uh, people have gotten those special circumstances before, and it's a case by case. So, you know, just like with any other course that you might have with your instructor, plead your case to your instructor, and we'll see what happens, right? Hi, uh, my name is Richard from QP. Uh, do you have any plan in the near future to have a PhD degree in this emergency and disaster management, either in DC or here in Doha? PhD, asking about PhD in the same field, a PhD program. Uh, that's not on the to-do list right now. And so uh, uh, ideally, uh, you know, for, from my perspective, I have a PhD. I would love for us to have a PhD program in this. Uh, but if that happens, it's not going to be in the near future. Thank you. Any other questions? Well, I would invite you to join us outside for some refreshments. Um, Tim and I will be available for additional questions. 
For now, though, thank you for coming. Thank you for your patience. Thank you for listening to the presentation. And we look forward to hearing from you with any questions you have. Good night.